Okay, Lisa, welcome to the show. Um, basically, our, our bodily sensations, um, that's, that's affect, and that is basically raw material. And then our previous experiences causes our brains to predict what those bodily sensations mean in a specific context. So could you maybe uh, help us distinguish between affect and emotions, make that clear distinction? And then I'd be curious to ask as well, how do you think about things like grief and things like loneliness? You know, is that, is that affect? Is that emotion? What, what are your thoughts there about those things? Yeah. So, um, so I think the first thing to, to answer your question, the first thing we have to understand is that the brain's most important job is not thinking, it's not feeling, it's not seeing, it's regulating the systems of your body. So you have a lot going on inside your body. So do I, so do all our listeners right now. There's a whole drama going on inside there. Lots and lots and lots of systems. They all have to be coordinated in a metabolically efficient way for you to stay healthy. And there's this constant transaction that's going on always throughout your entire life. Your brain sends predictions, sends, you know, neural commands to the body and the body sends sense data back to the brain constantly. That dialogue is going on all the time. And we're mostly the brain, your brain doesn't make itself aware of that. So if you're aware of all that drama going on inside your body, something's seriously wrong. And you're probably really suffering from discomfort because most of the time, you know, we're completely unaware. Maybe occasionally, you know, we'll run up the stairs or drink too much coffee and we'll feel our heart pounding against our chest. But even then, you know, you're not actually literally feeling your heart beat. You're feeling your heart vibrate. The, the, the pounding is the vibration of your heart against your um your bone, the bony part of your chest. And that's what you're feeling, right? So really, and everything you feel, you're feeling in your brain. You don't feel things in your body, just like you don't see in your eyes. You see, you know, in your brain, you hear, you know, if you pinch yourself, you feel that pinch in your brain. Okay. There's this whole, you know, symphony of sense data that is, um, um, moving up your spinal cord to your brain. But we're not wired to be aware of all those sensations. So if you think about vision, like, you know, high definition TV, then the sensory um, condition of your body is, is kind of like black and white TV from the 1950s with a bad antenna in the rain. You know, like you just, you you get like these vague feelings, like I'm feeling pleasant. I feel unpleasant. I'm feeling worked up. I'm feeling calm. I feel comfortable. I feel uncomfortable. That's affect. Or sometimes people call it mood. Um, but basically it's this ever present feeling. Are things okay? Are things not okay? Right? Are, am I feeling really worked up? Am I feeling really sleepy? That's affect. It's with you 24 seven all the time, even when you sleep, right? You're feeling it. And you're basically, your brain doesn't, isn't really wired and doesn't, isn't really wired to, to make uh, itself aware of the hundreds, if not thousands of um, sensory signals that are arriving all the time. And the ones that we are, we can be aware of, we're not usually aware of them unless something is really wrong. Mostly what our brains do is make the state of the body available as affect, as these sort of simple physical feelings that are always with us all the time. And there's not one cause of affect, right? Because affect arises from this whole drama going on inside us. It's like a very like a very basic summary. So it's not tied to any one thing, right? It, it arises, we would say in, in um, you know, computer science terms or engineering terms, we would say it's a low dimensional feature, meaning 
There's a lot of information that's being compressed into a single summary. And that summary doesn't have a lot of detail to it. And what our brains are doing is making sense. It's that brains don't make sense of affect, really. They make sense of the sense data that give rise to affect. So your brain is making sense of all of the sense data coming from here in the context of all the sense data coming from out here, what you see and smell and hear and taste in relation to the past, because your brain, you know, is in a dark silent box, it, it, your skull called your skull. It's receiving sense data, which are the outcomes. They're the effects of some set of causes, but your brain doesn't have access to the causes. It only has access to the outcomes. So a flash of light or a change in air pressure. So a flash of light, what is that flash of light? You know, could be many different things or, you know, you, you hear a, like a, a big bang, let's say, what's the bang? Is it a door slamming? Is it thunder? Is it, uh, you know, a car backfiring in the United States? Is it a gunshot? You know, it, uh, I'm assuming you don't have the same kind of situation with guns in Ireland that we have right here where, Let's don't even get me started. But the point being that um, your brain has to guess. And that's what predictions are. They're guesses. They're guesses based on past experience. So, you know, affect is a feature of consciousness. It arises because of your brain's main job, which is to regulate your body. And sometimes your brain will conjure an emotion while it's making sense of the sense data, but sometimes it conjures what we would conceive of as a thought or a perception, right? Somebody cuts you off on the highway and your experience is what an asshole. Well, there's affect right there in your perception of that person as being an asshole, right? Assholeness doesn't live in that person. <laughs> I mean, maybe that person is an asshole, <laughs> but maybe that person is rushing to the hospital um, to see a sick parent, or maybe that person is rushing to pick up their kids from daycare, or, you know, maybe they just didn't see you or, you know, they're basically affect is, is always with you all the time. And constantly we sort of look to the world to explain those, that those sensations, but they have many, many, or to explain the sensations that are wrought, that that affect is based on, but, you know, they have many different causes. Um, and only sometimes is, is affect, you know, emotion, not, not always. hundred um, percent. So in the book, you, you talk about, uh, you know, you were talking there about how affect is kind of, you know, it's blurry. It's very, it's amorphous. It's, you know, it's hard to sort of figure out what, what's actually going on there. But in the book, you talk around, um, if we want to make things more HD, um, emotional granularity can really help. And um, I think I heard you say one example where if a person only has two words, like happy and sad, that person is like a million times more likely to suffer from things like depression than somebody that's got a rich vocabulary for those, those concepts. Um, so could you maybe tell us a bit more about emotional granularity and why this is important to, to understand? Sure. So when you're feeling bad, what do you do? I think about what has caused me to feel this way so that I, well, right. But the, why are you thinking of, why are you trying to figure out what has caused you to feel this way? Because you don't know what to do and you're trying to figure out the cause in order to know what to do. Feeling bad doesn't tell you anything about what to do. Emotions, like every, every event that your brain creates, um, are prescriptions for action. Mm. So if that bad feeling, if you understand that bad feeling as coming from, you know, what, right? So if I understood that bad feeling that I was experiencing as being anxiety, I would do one set of things. And, and if I understood it as being, um, uh, 
curiosity, I, I would do a different set of things. Or here's an example. Um, people who have test anxiety have very negative affect, very negative, high arousal, negative feelings. They can't pass tests. They sometimes actually have to drop out of a class. Sometimes they drop out of school entirely. And um, that can change their earning potential for their entire lives, like by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, but they can learn to create a feeling of determination out of those sensations, right? So instead of the affect being co conjured into anxiety, it's conjured into determination. Um, you know, my, my daughter's sensei, when she was 12 years old, had this great phrase, you know, get your butterflies flying in formation, which I just thought was brilliant. And, um, and people learn to do it. So they're not learning to turn down the arousal because you need the arousal for learning. <laughs> like you need the arousal to move your body. You need the arousal to do what you need to do. So you're not changing the arousal. You're changing the meaning of it. Mm -hmm. And by learning to experience arousal as determination, people do actually pass tests and they do finish college. And that, you know, has a long-term benefit in their lives. That's an example of improving emotional granularity. Basically, the more concepts that you know for emotion, the more flexibility you have to make sense of sense data in a way that is actionable in specific situations. So concepts are tools for action. They're tools for living. That when your brain is remembering something from the past that is conjuring an event from the past in order to make predictions about what's going to happen next, what you're going to do next, what you're going to feel next. It's constructing a concept out of your past experience. The more concepts your brain can construct, the more flexibility you have in your action. And that's going to make you a more effective person. So the idea of emotional granularity is that you have more granular experience, meaning you're not um, you know, if you can, if you're generalizing too much from the past, like too many, like, for example, you, you, you're, if you survey so many events, the only thing they have in common is that they're, that um, they felt bad. <laughs> That's not telling you very much information about what you need to do next. You need something more precise. You need to generalize in a more precise way from the past, not just on negativity, but on other features as well. And that's what emotional granularity, that's a description of what emotional granularity is. And the idea that people who are more granular can cope better and are less um, likely to become depressed and, um, you know, actually recover from uh, cancer and other physical illnesses faster, all of that is research in the literature. I mean, like it's, it's remarkable actually, but because concepts are tools for regulating your body and preparing action in ways that are situated. So the more flexibility you have, the more you know, the more variety, the more the bigger your menu is, the more flexibility you have. And in the end, that is a good thing for you. Okay. Now, what are the implications of this on personal responsibility? And what are your thoughts on free will as well? Well, um, I can't really do justice to a complicated question um, about free will in um, the few minutes that we have left. But um, here's what I'll say, that um, if you want to change who you are or you want to change your actions in some way, you can't very easily reach back into your past and change your past. I mean, we try to do that in psychotherapy, for example, right? We, we try to change our understanding of the past. That everything that you experience today becomes, everything that you do today, everything you experience today becomes a past that your brain will draw on in the future to make predictions and to very automatically and effortlessly control your actions and construct your experience. So if you invest effort today 
to give yourself new experiences, to try new things, to learn new things, you're basically seeding your brain to predict differently in the future. And we're very familiar with with doing that kind of thing, right? So we exercise now, we invest a lot of energy in exercising because it will, you know, keep, make us, you know, a healthier, you know, keep us healthy, right? A better, stronger you in the future. We learn, we invest in, in learning skills, like we learn to play the piano or we learn to drive, or we learn to, you know, do mathematics, or we learn, you know, we can learn any number of things, right? Um, program a computer and the things that were are hard at the beginning that that are very effortful at the beginning if we practice them enough they become very effortless and very automatic driving a car is a really good example and it's the same thing with um, seeding your brain to predict differently if you cultivate new experiences curate new opportunities for yourself to learn you're investing energy it's an investment of, of resources, but if you practice them, it can become pretty automatic. And that's a way of changing your behavior in a very, you know, it, it's it's effortful at the beginning, but eventually it becomes effortless. You're basically um, creating your, an opportunity. Your brain is creating an opportunity for itself to have more granularity. And what this means is that in effect, we are somewhat responsible for ourselves, you know, for we are responsible for our actions, even when something bad happens to us. And I, this is the thing that I think is, I think people find most compelling actually about this view. And that is if something really bad happens to you and you're victim of something, something bad ha- happens that you have no control over, you're not culpable for the, for that, for all the, bad things that happened, right? It's not your fault, but you are responsible for fixing it because not because anything is your fault, but because you're the only one who can fix it, right? You're the only one. If you're, if you have experienced something traumatic in your life, if it's kind of like you're victimized twice, right? First, the actual bad thing happens to you and then you have to suffer the consequences of those. And then you learn you're the only one who can fix those consequences. It feels very unfair and it is unfair, but it's also kind of inspiring, right? Because it means that you actually can take the reins of your own life. Um, Even though you're not culpable, you're not blameworthy, you are responsible merely because sometimes we're responsible for things only because we're the only ones we, that can fix those things. And that's why we're responsible for them. Lisa, thank you so much for your time today and sharing some of your wisdom and knowledge with, with us. I really appreciate it. And I wish oh, you the best. My pleasure. Forward. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on your, on your show. Thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed the show. If you'd like to hear the full version, you can do so with the Weekend University Premium Membership. This gets you access to our master library of over 230 talks and interviews with the world's leading psychologists, professors, and authors, as well as transcripts, CPD certification, quizzes, and unlimited access to the recordings from our annual conferences. For more information, please go to theweekenduniversity.com forward slash membership.